Well, happy Easter, Christ Chapel. Great being able to worship with you and all of you joining us who are streaming. Uh, thank you for making uh, worship a priority in a weekend that I, I know is full of traditions. And I'm sure you have traditions. Uh, you got places to go. You got people to see. Uh, but uh, maybe one of your traditions is that you have an Easter egg hunt. Uh, anybody already had one or have one coming up here? Yeah, some of you begrudgingly are holding your hands up. You're like, yeah, tomorrow, man. Yeah, I've got it coming up. Uh, but Easter egg hunts, I guess, from what I've studied, have been happening historically for hundreds of years. And, it, and I think it's been fun for all ages, which is why it's stood the test of time. You know, people enjoy, the adults enjoy, you know, hiding the eggs. And certainly the, the kids enjoy running to go and, and find all of those. But as I thought about the, the Easter tradition of the Easter egg hunt, I've seen too many of them to realize there are too many analogies that go and correlate to real life. Real life is oftentimes like an Easter egg hunt. And what I mean by that is it starts off really exciting and it always ends with tears, you know? I mean, I haven't been to an Easter egg hunt that hasn't had tears because everybody thinks as we start off in life, it's gonna be great and we go skipping out there thinking that we are going to get not only the eggs that are set aside just for us, but also the, the best and the most and all of those things. And yeah, we might need some help as we stumble out of the gate and somebody might need to point us to the right direction. But eventually, you know, we'll, we'll get there and we start, we start thinking that we can load up, we can find it our own, our own way. We can do it ourselves. But then we find out that we can't. And I don't know if this kid is distraught because there are no eggs in his basket or he has the world's tiniest Easter basket. Um, <laughs> But sometimes we feel that way, that the big kids already ran ahead of us and took them all, and we don't have any. And then there's always a kid that's stealing the eggs out of somebody else's basket. And you get upset, where's mine? What is going on? All of these analogies play out into real life. Sure, you have gone out and searched and you've lived your life and you've come across some sweet treats every once in a while, those little Easter eggs, but the satisfaction is relatively short-lived. And then you're on to look for the next one and the next one and the next one. And we end up in this cycle of always looking for those Easter eggs that only give us short-lived satisfaction. And depending on how you see life, that can make you feel very unlucky or very unloved. Over the past three months, our church has been in a series where we are studying pretty much the most famous speech that has ever been given throughout history, and it's Jesus' speech called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and what we've realized is, and the reason why we've called that series Upside Down, is because basically Jesus is contradicting everything that his hearers knew. In fact, multiple times throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said X, but I tell you why. You thought it was this way, but it's actually the exact opposite. And Easter is no different. You see, Easter isn't about just the pomp and circumstance of the things that we get to do. It's not just about finding a great Easter outfit. It's not about finding the Easter eggs or hosting the Easter egg hunt. In fact, Easter is a celebration that is exactly opposite of all of those things. You see, Easter celebrates the fact that what was originally sought was not found. You see, we celebrate when we find things, but Easter is upside down. Easter celebrates the fact that what those ladies went to the tomb to find, they did not find. They went looking for a dead body of Jesus and it wasn't there. And we all say, praise God, hallelujah. So glad that they didn't find what they were looking for. That's what's mentioned here in Matthew chapter 28, verses five and six. As they went to the tomb, it, the angel uh, got them and he says, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. They were afraid because they didn't find what they were looking for. Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Guess what? He's not here. 
For he is risen as he told you, as he said. He told you this would happen. Come and see the place where he lay. You see, Easter's a celebration that the tomb was empty. If you want to host an Easter egg hunt that's biblically accurate, don't put anything in the eggs, okay? (laughs) Now, I don't recommend... This is probably one of the only times I will recommend not being biblically accurate, but put something in there for the kids. But that's really what we celebrate, that it wasn't found. And we praise God for that. And really, actually, them not finding what they had originally sought out looking for was certainly disappointing at first. They were distraught. They were afraid. What has happened But what started out as the biggest bummer turned out to be the biggest blessing because them not finding what they were looking for caused them to begin to ask questions that they got answers to. They found out where to seek Jesus, the one who was alive. Rather than seeking him in in a tomb where he would be dead, he said, go to Galilee. That's where he told you he would be. And he was alive up in Galilee so that they could have a relationship with him. See, they began asking the right questions, seeking the Savior, and it knocked their socks off. Where did they learn to do this? What Jesus said to do that. He said to ask and to seek and to knock. In fact, that's where we are as a church in the Sermon on the Mount. You see, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. If you then who are evil, or he's comparing um, the folks to a, a parent, if you then who are an evil or selfish parent, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You see, when they didn't find what they were originally looking for, they were led to something better. That's a great blessing. You see, what we realize and what Easter reminds us of is that God provides his best when we go to him asking, seeking, and knocking. When we don't try to make our own way, but when we go to him. Now, some of you are offended right now, and and I understand because you're saying, Cody, I have asked God for things and he hasn't done it. Well, first, we live in a broken and sinful world. Okay? But second, let me remind you that Jesus does not say he's here to be your genie in a bottle. He, the context that's here is a good heavenly father. That's the context. If you who are evil or selfish know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Every good parent only gives their kids what's best. In fact, you would be a bad parent if you gave your children everything that they asked for. Just this past Wednesday, uh, my wife and I, uh, we have two sons. One is 10. On Wednesday, our five-year-old turns six. Little hazy crazy, as we call him. So Hayes turned six. We were trying to ask what he wanted for his birthday. And he said what he wanted was one of those little battery-powered cars that toddlers have. You know, like you, you see those. And he wants it because our next-door neighbor, he is, they have a two-year-old. He has one of those. And that's why he wants it. And I said, Hayes, like, you're about to turn six, buddy. Like, you are way too big for one of those toddler cars. And he said, well, can I drive mom's car then? <laughs> very clever little six-year-old that he is, I would be a terrible parent to give him what he asked for. The context here is a good heavenly father, and we always get his best when we go to him. And so what I want to do is I just want to walk through those verbs very simply, and I want to show you how God provides his best when you go to him asking, seeking, and knocking. And for those of you who are music aficionados, I'm going to put some little Easter eggs, sprinkle those throughout here. So if you really are a music aficionado, you'll know exactly what they are. So let's talk about asking. What do we ask for? Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Well, we ask for things that we cannot provide, right? 
I mean, if you've got it, if you can provide it for yourself, you don't need to ask for it. So those are the things that we need to ask for. Now, asking is antithetical to every warm-blooded American because you were raised, just as I was raised, to live the American dream, meaning you can be anything you want to be and you can achieve anything you want to achieve as long as you set your mind to it and work hard enough for it. Great aspirational phrases that are complete lies. <laughs> you can't be anything you want to be. And you can't achieve everything that you want to achieve. And you know why? Because I hit that roadblock. Because I grew up wanting to be perfect. I wanted to be perfect. And the reason why I wanted to be perfect was because I thought that everybody around me would accept me if I was perfect. You see, if I made a mistake with somebody, if I was imperfect with somebody, then that would sever our relationship. Of course, that would give them a right to not be my friend or to not like me, etc. cetera. And so I, I, my entire life was focused on being 100% Perfect. It's what I wanted to be and it's what I worked for and I couldn't. Neither can you. It doesn't matter how much you aspire to be perfect. It doesn't matter how hard you work to be perfect. You cannot be perfect. We're in the same boat. And that creates a great problem when we are trying to relate to a perfect God. He is 100% perfect, 100% holy. And so how do we relate to him? How do we get right with him if he's perfect? Well, that's why God gave Jesus. God gave Jesus to be your savior. He gave him to live the life, the perfect life, the sinless life as a substitute for your imperfect life and my imperfect life. And then he substituted himself, dying on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin so that he could bridge the gap between us, sinners, and a holy and perfect God. That's why he sent him. You see, we should ask for those things we can't provide. And we think we ask for those things when we ask, God, give me this job, give me this house, give me this relationship, give me these things. Man, you cannot provide perfection. <laughs> That's what we should be asking for. But when we ask for that, a perfect relationship with a holy God, Jesus is there to stand in the gap. He says, ask and you will receive. How do you receive that? By grace, through faith. You just tell him you want it. You recognize that you can't do it. You can't be perfect. And you want what he is offering. In fact, that was my prayer when I was 16 years old into my junior year in high school when I came to know Christ I said God I know I can't be perfect and I need your help that was it and that put me in a right relationship with God that is available to you today ask for the things that you cannot provide one of those things you can't provide is a relationship with the holy God that's why Jesus stands in the gap or let's talk about seeking. What do you seek after? Jesus says, seek and you will find. Well, we seek after things that we do not yet have. Right? We go after those things we don't yet possess or, or maybe we've tasted but we want more of. So we, we seek after those things but we still haven't found what we're looking for. Nobody. Okay. That was an Easter egg for you. Wake up. You can't get the satisfaction that you're looking for. Okay, that's a little more obvious to you, huh? Figured you have to have a Rolling Stones analogy, you know, song? Because today is about Rolling Stones, right? Easter? Yeah, it's bad, I get it, okay? I don't care if you're laughing at me or with me, just laughing is good. But you see, we search for all those things in, in all the places that we shouldn't. And we wander off into the weeds further and further away from God when we seek after those things that we think will satisfy us, whether it is that promotion or is that relationship or is that neighborhood or is that friendship or is that network. It doesn't matter. 
We search for all those things and we end up disappointed, just like that little boy in that picture because it's never enough. It doesn't fill the basket. We can't get enough. And that's why he sent his son. You see, because when we go searching off into the weeds, we get lost. Have you ever hosted an Easter egg hunt and you get the kid who goes like a quarter mile off, you know, it, to, to think that they, they're gonna find one out there. And you're like, I promise, kid, we didn't hide one that far away. Like they're in the backyard. But they, they're determined and they go, you know, close to the highway or close to the street. And you're like, no, that's dangerous for you. Come back. You see, God knew that we would look in all those dangerous places and we'd wander off into the weeds. He knew we wouldn't seek after him. None of us seek after him. And so that's why he sent Jesus to seek after you. He sent somebody on a search and rescue mission for you. In fact, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it's Jesus' stated purpose to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. He knew that you wouldn't be looking for him, so he had to come and look for you. I told you we have a, now a six-year-old. Imagine that Hayes and I are in the grocery store and imagine somehow we get separated in the grocery store. It would be completely unreasonable and unloving for me to stand still and to believe that Hayes is gonna have to find his way back to me, wouldn't it? No parent would do that, no parent. You would go running through every aisle to find your child. And that's exactly what Jesus does for you. He doesn't stand there and say, you come to me. And maybe some of you, see, the question about that is, do you want to be found? He's seeking after you. And you might not want to be found because you are full of shame. Or you might feel like you're going to get scolded. And that's not God. Why would he seek after you? He knows you're out in the weeds, just like I was. He knows our propensity to wander away. And yet he seeks after us anyway. Do you want to be found? Jesus says, seek and you will find. James chapter four, verse eight, one of my favorite verses, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's just waiting for you to turn around. (laughs) He's chasing after you. You just turn to him. But he's not just seeking after you. There's a knocking aspect. Think about when do we knock? We knock on doors that we cannot open. That's why you knock on a door. You want to alert a person on the other side that you would like to come in and you need them to unlock that door. You can't get in, you can't have uh, that, that time with them or get into wherever they are unless they unlock the door. And, And heaven is no different. You can knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. <laughs> okay. I see you shaking your head, Benjamin. Uh, you, can, you can do that, but guess what? He's, he's the only one that can unlock the door. It's, heaven's door is locked. But that's why God sent Jesus to open heaven's door for you. I want to be clear about something because this is a misnomer in our culture today. Heaven is not everyone's default destination. I think so many people think that they're just going to end up there one day. And it doesn't work like that. Jesus is the door and he's the one who can unlock that into heaven. And the ones he lets in are the ones who's, who's made a reservation <laughs> They're the ones who already have a relationship. And that totally makes sense. I mean, imagine if I showed up at your house and I knock on the door and you open it and I said, I'm here to live here forever. (laughs) And you would go, I I don't know anything about you. I don't don't know who you are. Why should I let you here? You you just randomly showed up. I never knew that you wanted to be here. That doesn't work that way. It's the same way with Jesus. He he says he wants you to be with him. Do you want to be with him forever? 
You tell him, I want to be there. I want to be with you, and I need you, Jesus, to unlock that door. But here's the catch. He'll open it for anybody who wants to be with him. Anybody who has a relationship with him. Anybody who's made that reservation with him. But the catch is this. A corpse cannot unlock a door. You get me? A corpse cannot unlock it. It takes a live person to open that door. And that's what we celebrate this Easter, is that Jesus is alive. He's alive since that first Easter morning, as alive as he is today, as alive as he ever will be. See, Easter instills hope in us because Jesus is alive. And he continues to answer our search for abundant life. We can always go to him. It's not just that he unlocks the door once. It's not just that he answers the question once. It's not just that he points us in the right direction once. In fact, all of those verbs in in the Greek, they're, they're present participles. It means continuous action, continue asking, continue seeking, continue knocking. You can always go to him. And it wouldn't make any hill of beans difference if he was dead. And you go and you ask a corpse, hey, what do you think about this? He's not saying anything, but he's alive, and he wants to lead you into abundant life today. In fact, he says that in John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, I am the door. You don't get into heaven without going through him. If anyone enters by me, by faith in me, then he will be saved And guess what? He will go in and out and find pasture. It's this shepherd and sheep motif where he's saying, you have my watch care as one of my sheep. You have my sovereign care over you. My eye is always on you and I will provide for your needs. You see, but there's somebody else out there who wants to lead you to make you seek in all the wrong places and that's the thief. And he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that you may have life eternal, but also life today abundant. As I've been praying about this message, my prayer for you and for me is that this Easter would look a lot more like the first Easter. That we would figure out that the things that we've been searching for in our lives are dead ends and they're empty tombs it would cause us to begin to ask the right questions of God, to seek life only in him, because I know that when we do, he'll knock your socks off. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. Thank you that you sought after us. And thank you that when you give us these promises, that when we ask that we receive, that when we seek, that, we, that, that, that you will show us the way. Lord, these aren't empty promises. Those promises weren't buried in the grave with your body, but they're alive and well because you are alive and well and you walk with us, Lord. And we thank you for that. Would you continue to not only turn us toward you, but to walk beside us and lead us into the life abundant, life everlasting. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.